What should investors and your employees know about how the company has changed as a result of AXA no longer being a part of it? Well, for the first time in our 160 years history, we are a public company and independent. So that means we uh, get to build a house we want to live in. So uh, what's changed is the uh, strategy, the investment decisions, and the culture is really set by us here in New York. It's I'm a very, very exciting time. For yeah, us. I'm curious when it comes to culture. We've been talking a lot about sustainability this morning, which I want to talk to you about. Yeah. But what would be different about the culture of Equitable versus AXA Equitable? So AXA would obviously look at uh, the business through the eyes of a multinational 150 country uh, organization. We're here to provide uh, financial well-being for Americans. Uh, we are an American company listed here on the New York Stock Exchange. So it really means much more focus for us and much, uh, getting much closer to our clients. And uh, very exciting for us to have this job. You also manage as much as $700 billion in assets. Yes. Uh, you know, this morning we got potentially important news from BlackRock and its CEO Larry Fink in his letter to CEOs talking about sustainability, sort of focusing on ESG in a way that we haven't seen perhaps from that, that firm with $7 trillion in assets. I'd love you to take a listen and sort of uh, give me your sense uh, as to how you approach this and how important it is. But let's listen to Mr. Fink. We don't have a loud enough conversation and we are not focusing on this redistribution of capital. And I believe we're going to see more and more um, investors looking for advice. Where should they invest their money? Okay. Wasn't particularly <laughs> forthcoming there in terms of what we were talking about. But how do you view ESG right now? in terms of that $700 billion. Yeah, I, I think it's a fundamental trend that we're going to be seeing over the next few years and decades. And for a company like Equitable, where we invest for the long term, we provide retirement provision for people that may last 40, 50, 60 years. So obviously something like responsible investing and sustainability is critical for us. So it's something we intend to be part of the conversation going forward. And uh, it's, it, it's really important for all investors, but particularly for retirement and insurance companies like us. In terms of that long-term investing timeline, given the fact that it's just low interest rates and has been for years now, yeah. how much has that been a drag uh, in terms of the investment portfolio, and how much have you been able to offset that with things like equities? Yeah. Well, look, we've been around 160 years, so yep. we've seen a lot of ups and downs, and we've seen interest rates at the 16% and now below, below 2%. So we do invest for the long term. We do to, uh, look to match our assets and our, and our liabilities as we're going forward. And we have seen something like 85% of our products sold today now don't have an interest rate uh, uh, guarantee element to them, hmm. much more of an equity component with perhaps some downside protection. So consumers are, are, are looking for some upside but want some protection, and the products we put in the marketplace are meeting that need today. Yeah. I wonder what you make of, I mean, there's a big generation of young people who are graduating into money, right? And they're they're going to need it to be managed, but uh, their memories are short because they're young. Uh, they've never known high costs of capital. They remember the recession. How is that affecting their attitude toward equities, at least? Yeah, well, we are encouraging people to look at their, their whole life uh, 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 style and the whole age of when they invest and look to the longer term and not panic too much on some of the short-term gyrations. Um, so I think it's very important to give advice that is um, uh, appropriate for the individual rather than have one size uh, 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 fits all. Um, you know, we do... Uh, our, our, our clients are uh, both baby do boomers, but we also are very proud to serve about a million teachers, and the average age there would be 45, 46, younger. And again, we would be encouraging them to, to be looking for their retirement years, which is some years out, and invest appropriately. Number two, I believe in variable annuities. Uh, quite a number of analysts are bullish on the stock right now. In large part, I think there's this sense that perhaps you could do some sort of risk transfer um, is that in the future, especially uh, with these new variable annuity framework that's taken effect? Yeah, about 60% of our earnings come from our individual retirement business. And that business has had a boost recently with the SECURE Act. I mean, one of the few bipartisan uh, 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 projects in, in, in Washington has had a very, very big boost. So I myself think we'll see much more 
of variable annuities come into play in 401ks and other retirement products, helping people secure income in their retirement. So we're bullish on, on variable annuity, and we think it's going to be a good source of growth for us over the years to come. Yeah, I mean, to Carl's point, though, a low-rate environment, obviously you're not in the fixed annuity business, but nonetheless, no. you've got to get, I think, a, a generation here accustomed to the idea that returns are not going to be potentially what they once were, particularly if you're weighted towards fixed income. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I think maybe my training helped there. I came from Japan before coming here, <laughs> so we were we were used for zero percent there for, for a little while. But yes, absolutely, it has to be the mix of the assets have to reflect uh, the environment we're in and the length of the uh, uh, duration of the uh, liabilities uh, and uh, the promises we're making. Do you, I mean, we got CPI today. It's very difficult to get the, inf the, the economy to run hot enough, enough to where inflation is a story again. Do you yeah. worry about the Japanification of the U.S., as some like to call it? No, I don't think so. I think if, if my memory is right, I think the Nikkei is still 38 percent off its all-time high. I, I, I don't see that in the U.S. The economy is still extremely strong and the markets are, uh, are still um, very, very buoyant. So, no, I wouldn't see that. So. What about demographics? Because when you think about Japan, you think about the fact that they have a rapidly aging population and not nearly replacing. Yeah. Um, we're kind of getting close to that here in the U.S. Is that a long-term concern? Um, it's something we look at, you know, with our history and looking for the long term, we look at all of the macroeconomics. But, I mean, I think the thing that's really driving our business is 10,000 Americans a day are turning 65. Uh, and uh, the retirement gap is uh, so large in the U.S. And we have a business where we can help people and do well as a business as we go along. That's the main What's the uh, retirement dynamic. gap? What, what does that actually mean? Um, if you look at the ACLI, uh, the Association uh, of Life Insurers, if you look at their website, the average American lives 23 years after retirement and on the date of retirement has something like 19 months of income saved. That's the gap in human terms. Um, and we exist to, to help um, Americans secure their financial well-being so they can live long and fulfilling lives. I think the other thing that happens today is people's aspirations in retirement is so much greater than, let's say, when my grandfather retired. People are setting up businesses, they're going back to school, they're teaching, they're traveling. So really our purpose as, as equitable is really to help people fulfill the lives they want to live. And that's the real main demographic we look at. We've seen so much capital going into the fintech space in terms of startups. We're starting to see uh, more deal making and acquisitions as well. And it's not just we talk about some of the other financial services companies, banks, for example, but we're seeing it in insure tech as well. Uh, now that acts is completely out of the picture, you're standalone, you're forging ahead on your new strategy. Does it include some of this insure tech? Yes, um, we use a technology to uh, disrupt ourselves, if you like. So we put technology in the business, ranging right from Alliance Bernstein, our subsidiary, on how we uh, how we how we uh, analyze uh, results and investments, all right, all the way through to the tools we give our advisors. I think one of the things that we really set our stall out on is face-to-face -face advice. Um, we, we, we see Americans today, when they're looking to protect their families or plan for their retirement, they still want face-to-face -face advice. The technology behind the advisor is really where we're investing and where we see quite a lot of disruption to the internal model. It's interesting to hear you say that because there has been such a focus on how, even if it's face-to-face -face advice, how you match up with the people who are looking for certain products or certain services, especially in an industry that's getting busier and getting more crowded. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I don't think people just go to one source for information yeah. anymore. Even if it is face-to-face, -face, they're doing a lot of research behind the scenes, uh, looking at our website, looking at uh, uh, reviews, looking at references going. I don't think anybody just goes to one source anymore, whether it's direct or through an intermediary. Uh, uh, finally, you still own, what, 65% of Alliance Bernstein, yeah. correct? I mean, active management has been in retreat for some time now. We've seen the growth of all the passive vehicles. Is that an overall threat to that business, or are they effectively managing it? The business is performing very well in Alliance Bernstein, seven quarters in a row of net funds flow. Um, it's going into alternates, and Alliance Bernstein also has a very, very powerful Asian business, which is still uh, doing extremely well. So the combination of that is offsetting some of the trends you see on the traditional. And as I say, seven quarters in a row, there have been uh, net positive fund flows, which uh, I don't think uh, many peers can say. We got some... Uh data in the last week about survival rates of various cancers. It's amazing what's happening to 
uh, survive, survivors of cancer. It's no longer a death sentence by any means in this country. I wonder, would a dramatic increase in average life expectancy in this country have a meaningful impact on the business long term? Um, well, I think we are seeing already, I mean, we were just sharing earlier, in 1859 when we were established, the uh, life expectancy was around 50 years. Now uh, a child born in 2007 has a 50% chance of living to 107. So oh this, this is a blessing, um, but it does require people to plan their finances perhaps more than they used to do. But I think it also begs the question, will there always be a place for something like term life insurance or is it going away? No, I think uh, a, a term life meets a particular need at certain times in people's lives. They'll need additional protection and cover. Uh, let's say it's a young family has got uh, a, a mortgage and young kids. They'll need some protection during that time uh, in case something happens to the breadwinner. So I think it's here to stay. And what was that retirement gap? 19 months versus 23 years? Yes, Is that, did right. I hear that appropriate? Yes, that's right. That's a scary yes. gap. Wow. On average.